All right. Well, let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to a discussion of hospital CEO compensation. My name is Vikas Sani, and I'm president of the Lown Institute. And I'm Shannon Brownlee, special advisor to the president of the Lown Institute, and we're happy to have you all here for this discussion. Indeed. Uh, so here at the Lown Institute, we believe that a radically better healthcare system that's rooted in social responsibility is possible. More than possible, it's really necessary. Uh, but to get there, we do need some benchmarks, and we need the right benchmarks. That's why we created the Lown Hospitals Index. That's to measure hospital social responsibility using metrics, many of which have never been used before, like racial inclusivity or community benefit investment, pay equity, which is what we're going to talk about today. Our pay equity metric measures how much hospital CEOs are compensated compared to the non-professional hospital staff, those without advanced degrees. Uh, the results of this metric and more than 50 others are what we publish on our website, lownhospitalsindex.org. Now, some of you may have found out about this event uh, from our recent article in Health Affairs, which looked at pay equity across more than a thousand nonprofits. So that's a subset. Uh, we'll go into those findings a little bit later, but you can read the full article now uh, at the Health Affairs Forum on their website. So pay equity in healthcare has been a longstanding problem. Um, as it is in some parts of the other the rest of the economy. Um, but COVID-19 really brought these inequities into the spotlight. Um, to illustrate in August, 2020, a man named Jamel Brown, who was a hospital technician in Kansas City, Missouri, got COVID on the job. And he makes $30,000 a year, but he was named employee of the month when he got back to work. And he was given a $6 gift voucher for the hospital cafeteria. Uh, meanwhile, the CEO of HCA Healthcare, the health system that owns the hospital, made $30 million in total compensation that year. So is health equity, uh, pay equity, a problem in healthcare? I mean, should we even be concerned about high CEO pay? And, and what is actually high? Uh, and what are alternatives to the status quo? So to help us dig deeper into these questions, uh, let's bring in our guests. Alan Weil, Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs, leading journal at the intersection of health, healthcare, and policy. Prior to this, he was the Executive Director of the National Academy for State Health Policy. And previously, he was at the Urban Institute uh, directing their assessment of the new federalism project. And Meryl Guzner, my friend and colleague, is an American journalist, author, and educator. He served as the editor of Modern Healthcare from 2012 to 2017. And now he writes and edits Goose News, an online newsletter on healthcare, public policy, and politics, which I highly recommend. Over the course of Merrill's four decades in journalism, he served as a correspondent for the Chicago Trib and a professor of journalism at NYU. He's the author of The $800 Million Pill, The true Truth Behind the Cost of New Drugs. So um, I have a question for everybody, including you, Vikas. Um, what does Jamel's, Jamel Brown's story tell us, if anything, about the state of our healthcare system? Is there, is there a larger message here? Um, so Merrill, why don't you go first? Sure. Uh, let's, I, I think we should put it in context. Uh, CEO pay in relationship to average worker pay has been going up across the entire society for close to half a century now. Uh, and what we've seen in the hospital sector is a mirror of that large society and has the very same problem. You know, if you look at uh, CEO pay uh, in the private sector, it's gone from 30 to one compared to the average salary in the 1960s to about 70 to one at the end of the 1980s. And today it's 250 to 301. So at one level, hospital CEO pay is, if anything, a little bit behind that. But then, which I think you have done very successfully in your own piece along with Vikas, this is to take a look at the nonprofit sector, which of course accounts for about 80% of all the beds uh, that are out there in hospitals. And there we, we see the kind of ratios that are 
you know, not as high, but still quite high and have been rising for a number of years. And then as you accurately point out, compared to other major nonprofit systems, I think the most comparable one out there is university, major universities. And there, what you see in the hospital sector uh, is probably the, you know, the highest salaries, you know, which can go to six, seven, eight million dollars a year, and some of them even higher. But there you see it's kind of common for large systems. You look at universities, eh, it's more like two, three, four million dollars for top CEO pay. So hospitals even quite outdistance that. So I think it's, uh, you know, within the nonprofit world, the hospitals have, if we want to look at it, call it this, the biggest problem. And I think it is a problem. Alan, any thoughts on this, the large picture? Yeah, well, I certainly agree with Merrill that it's it's a systemic issue in the U.S. economy, and it's not isolated to this area. Uh, that, of course, doesn't make it not a problem. It just means it is a problem elsewhere as well. And I think one of the questions we have to ask whenever we see a problem that's systemic is who whose job is it to fix it? Um, a lot of compensation is set by, and I know we'll get into this in later conversation, but it's set by compensation committees that what do they do? They reference what other people are paid. And so, you know, the systemic problem just gets baked in. Um, I'll also return to this theme, but I'm, I'm much more concerned about Jamel Brown than I am about how much the CEO makes. And I think the, the real systemic issue here is gross underpayment of, again, not just in healthcare, but of a large portion of the workforce uh, and, 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 uh, particularly so in healthcare, but we see it in retail and other sectors as well, where you literally can't uh, make a living wage. And so the disparity is visible and problematic, but the disparity, of course, is the numerator over the denominator. And uh, if we could do something about the denominator, I'd feel a whole lot better about the numerator. And Vikas, your thoughts? Uh, I don't really have a lot. Uh, different to add. The one thing I would say, if you if we ask the question, what does Jamel's Brown story tell us? I would put it a different way. It tells us that when we imagine the work of an organization, when we imagine the mission and what gets delivered of an organization, we probably have to recalibrate our sense of where the value is. Uh, because frontline workers in the COVID pandemic you know, have famously faced unbelievable conditions. That's true across the board. And, and that's also true outside of healthcare, restaurant workers, others. And what the pandemic really illuminated for all of us is there's a lot of stuff we take for granted and we haven't valued it much. And now we see that maybe it really is time for a recalculation. Great, well, we should move on. Sure. Uh, we actually have uh, slides for some of the, the comments people people made. So super. Go ahead, Vikas. Yeah. So I, I just want to take a, a, a deeper look at some of the numbers. Uh, in our analysis for health affairs, we looked at a subset of nonprofit hospitals where we didn't do any imputation. And that was just to have a very, very clean one and avoid a lot of controversy and debate about the technical issues. Uh, we found that CEOs on average make about $587,000 per year, which is about $250 an hour. But if you look at the top and the bottom performing hospitals, there's a pretty dramatic difference in CEO pay. And when we say top performing, we mean the ones with the lowest differential with the best pay equity ratio. The CEOs at the, in the top 50 hospitals made $65 an hour, while the CEOs at the, at the bottom, i.e. the ones who were highest paid, made more than $900 an hour. Meanwhile, worker pay was essentially the same between the two groups, so that just illustrates something right there. So let, let's add a little bit more context here. Um, by comparing nonprofit hospitals to other types of nonprofits, um, it turns out that hospital CEOs make the most of any nonprofit industry by far. University CEO salaries are the closest, uh, a little bit more than half of what hospital CEOs make on average. Um, and, and even when you look at nonprofits with similar revenue streams, um, hospital CEOs tend to make a lot more at some hospitals. So for example, the highest paid executive 
at, at many hospitals. So it, look at the highest paid executive at the American Red Cross, who was paid $800,000 in 2018. And by comparison, the president and CEO of the Oxner Clinic Foundation, a large health system in New Orleans, made $5 million that same year, quite a differential. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, I, I have a contrarian streak, so I'll, I'll try to keep it a little bit in check. But look, at some level, isn't this, I mean, why are we so surprised or shocked? Large organizations and institutions have big budgets. They have a lot of responsibilities, um, even in nonprofit hospitals. This is life and death stuff. Come on. So, Meryl, does it make sense that hospitals pay their CEOs more than other non-hospital nonprofits? Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think that the tasks that confront hospital CEOs are different in kind that uh, face other CEOs at nonprofits. Uh, you know, if you look at healthcare and education, higher education, we've seen some of the biggest inflation numbers in terms of the price of services over the last 20, 30, 40 years in these sectors. And so, uh, you know, they operate on a kind of budgeted system where sources of revenue are more or less guaranteed uh, in, in, in large fashion. This is very different than a private sector business, uh, which really does rise and fall on the sale of its product or the quality of its service or whatever. Uh, I think that they have a much more stable platform to operate on. And so the kind of financial engineering skills that are rewarded in the private sector are, are not really what are the top uppermost skills that you need to have to run a big hospital system. Uh, just one simple example. I mean, employee retention is huge in healthcare. Uh, you know, a lot of private sector businesses thrive off churn. And so uh, it's a very different kind of, me and every company, depending on your sector in the private sector, is very different. So I think that the question that you raise is, is like, you know, is a, should we, because it's a very large dollar volume business in healthcare, uh, should we therefore reward these uh, men and women the same way that they do in the private sector? I would argue no. Uh, I think that what we need to do is, is have a different set of metrics, uh, which I'm sure we'll get into what those might be. But I think that there's a powerful argument that just on the finances themselves to say that, no, I don't think these large nonprofit institutions need to operate the way private sector institutions operate. And therefore, you don't need the same skill set in order to run them. Not that that argues in favor of the salaries being made in the private sector. Don't get me wrong there. I think they're over, grossly overpaid as well. But the skill set is not an argument in favor uh, for them having somehow the same level of pay at the private sector, wherever it's, at, wherever it's at. Alan, you look like you might have a different point of view. Oh, I don't know that it's so different. Um, I'm not sure I think that uh, revenue is guaranteed in healthcare and not elsewhere. I do think revenue streams are different, um, but it, they're still highly competitive market pressures in these most of these hospital systems. So I guess that's where I started to maybe diverge a little bit, Meryl, from your take on it. Otherwise, I'd say mine is fairly consistent. You know, it reminds me of a comment I once heard George, George Halverson say, uh, he was former CEO of the Kaiser system. You know, when we talk about insurance companies having an incentive to, to keep costs down because it should help them with their ability to sell their product, his comment was, you know, it's basically a cost plus business. The more claims that run through you, uh, you even if you're taking a fixed percentage of administrative and profit overhead, you know, if health costs double, then your, your margin, uh, the dollars associated with your margin double. And I think that's really what we're seeing here. These are just very large dollar enterprises and uh, they're accustomed to siphoning a large share of those off to pay the CEO. Um, it's not a labor market the same way the market is for the uh, lower paid workers where they, uh, you're, you're really looking out at what others in the sector pay. Um, these are much, you know, these are a few people. 
And so it doesn't have the same sort of market dynamics that put downward pressure on it. Um, Interesting. So yeah. no, I, 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 Please go ahead. No, it's absolutely, I totally agree that that lack of downward pressure is part of the problem and the whole system, but including CEO pay. Right. And I mean, I think, you know, again, I know we want to get to solutions sort of toward the end, but I, I, I think we, we do in these sort of systemic situations of high levels of payment, you have to start asking what are the levers and do you want to use those levers? I mean, certainly part of what's notable here as your comparisons are to other nonprofits. Well, I'm no expert on the American Red Cross, but I know they rely a fair amount on private donations. I know hospitals have charitable donations as well, but their primary revenue stream comes through services. And I think uh, an organization like the Red Cross has to meet a certain sort of test in the public's mind, in fact, there were there was a big uh, scandal. I recall it uh, when it was revealed what the salaries were, and people thought they were out of line. And uh, so, I, but you don't see that in a hospital because you're not uh, as dependent on uh, those kinds of contributions. So, and it's worth just very briefly remembering how hospitals. Uh, CEOs and, and C-suites came to be paid quite so highly. One of the one of the forces was the the increasing sort of corporatization of hospital boards. Um, you know, titans of industry want to sit on hospital boards, and they bring their values, they bring their habits to the process of making decisions about how much the CEO should make and what skills the CEO should have. So there's sort of been a, a an increasing corporatization of the entire hospital sector over this period of time when we've seen rising CEO pay. So um, I have another question for both of you. Um, is there a threshold at which hospital CEO become uh, pay becomes too high? I mean, do we have any idea where to draw that line? Uh, I don't know that, I think the answer is yes. Uh, but and, and I think that the idea that uh, people in the pay equity movement who are trying to redress some of the inequality in our society, when they look at CEO to median uh, uh, wage ratios, uh, what they do is they look at that ratio and they say, that's where you would draw the line. So, uh, you know, should it be back at 30 where it was in the 1960s or should it be back at 70 where it was at the end of the 1980s, which was ostensibly the decade of greed for those of us who can, are old enough to remember <laughs> that? Uh, or, you know, where you would draw the line is, is obviously of interest. I think, but Shannon, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think boards need to be paying attention to this. And that's where, you know, they're the ones who can say, okay, what is, what is the, you know, where are we on the spectrum of where, you know, and therefore what should our ratio be? I think that that's very valid. And I also hope we get back to the point that Alan made a little earlier, which is, is that, you know, that ratio is, can be driven by the denominator as well as the numerator. And that's, you know, really what we also need to be discussing. Yes. Well, yeah. I, one thing about that though, let's be clear, uh, you can move the denominator, uh, the numerator is still the numerator. Those numbers are still there. And the solution isn't to pay everybody more when you're already at 20% of GDP. So th there are certain limits, let's be clear. And, and, and let's remember, we all pay, either through right. our taxes or our insurance premiums. So, so there's a question. Uh, sort of, yeah, go ahead. That, well, that's sort of where I wanted to go. I mean, it's kind of like healthcare spending. We know it's too high, but if you ask someone to draw the line, that's a perilous undertaking. And I'm certainly not dumb enough to do that um, in a public setting with respect to hospital CEO pay. But, um, but I think we need to ask, why should there be a line? And I would come back to, to two elements. One is the favored tax status. It, you are getting a significant benefit from the public to be a non to be organized as a nonprofit. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't think there are problems with high CEO pay in privately held organizations, but uh, but let's at least start with the nonprofits. But the other is the dominance of public funding um, on the service side. Of course, you know half of healthcare spending now comes from 
the government, whether through Medicare, Medicaid, and even on the commercial side, uh, the vast majority of that comes through employer-sponsored insurance, which is tax preferred. So these are public dollars heavily feeding into this. And to me, that's the rationale here between nonprofit status and high level of public financing. We as a society have an interest in saying there should be limits to how much any one person can take out of this system. So and, again, well, I, again, I, I can't be a contrarian on that because that's exactly the way I feel about it. That this is this is mostly public dollars. It's my dollars and your dollars. And I can choose not to brush my teeth with toothpaste. I can make my own toothpaste and not buy, you know, Procter and Gamble products, but I can't choose not to pay for healthcare collectively. And let me dig a little bit under the first point that Alan made, which is, is, you know, what do you, why have we given them nonprofit status? And that gets to the mission of what the healthcare sector is. And the mission of the healthcare se sector is, is to promote the health of society and how we define the health of society. Uh, and, and, you know, the wellness of individuals, obviously, within that, but, and, and to, to cure their sicknesses. But how we define the health of a society, you know, equality in income or inequality in income, social factors. I mean, there are all of these things that enter into that. And then when we grant them nonprofit status, that is what we are rewarding them for. And so therefore, uh, we, we ought to create criteria uh, that actually ties their salaries to those kinds of factors, not and in exchange for this nonprofit status. And when you pay these extraordinarily high salaries, you're sending the exact opposite message of what they've been created to do. So it also gets to the very heart of the mission. And I, and I think in some ways, especially you know, for, so, you know, for people who are socially concerned, I think that's one of the biggest problems with this. It actually exacerbates the very problem they have been set up to solve. Yeah. Let me ask a question. Uh, I know we're starting to run over time for this section, but uh, I'm going to, I'm, the question is, uh, let's all agree there's a problem, but, but what kind of problem is it? And, and let me just toss this out. That little distinction that Merrill and Alan, you, you made about whether hospitals have guaranteed revenue or whether they have to compete. I mean, I, I think it's, it's really both. And I think it speaks to one of the deep, deep contradictions inside healthcare, which is to say, you know, I can choose whether I buy an iPhone or a Samsung, um, but really the shopping when I'm having an MR heart attack or, you know, or something like that, it, it's really not there. And in a sense, the healthcare sector has sick people as hostages because they don't really control when they get sick, how they get sick. They certainly don't control the pricing. And on the other hand, we have created a system of market competition for hospitals. So they do compete for revenue, but it's not in the traditional sense. My iPhone's better than your Samsung. It's really along the lines of, well, you know, let me, you know, put billboards up for all the atrial fib I can ablate and, and people who barely know what that is are dazzled by it and, and let's build this, that, or the other. It's a different model in many ways. And I think it speaks to these questions. What kind of problem is this? Is it a business problem? Is it a values problem? Is it a, is it a professionalism problem or something else? Uh, yes, is my answer. <laughs> yeah. Also uh, an ethical problem. Yeah, yeah. so so I, I, I don't want to go too far down the last your last comment but you know shopability of services which is sort of what you're getting at about uh, people being captive and billboards that's I, I don't think that's really the dominant driver here it's mm -hmm. physician system alignment with hospitals it's feeder patterns of from primary care th through specialty care through group practices uh, who it, you go to the doc you go to the hospital your doctor tells you to go to for the vast majority of services. The billboards are good for emergency room uh, time, wait times. So, so I, I wouldn't want to go too far down that path. I, I think this is, first of all, I think every, all the language we've talked about thus far is an ethical problem. Um, that's how I see it. It's a resource allocation, fairness, equity. That's, those are all the language of ethics. 
But I do think it's a value problem, and we've gotten into this, and I know we should spend more on it, which is if you're sending the signal that this is what you value, then CEO time and effort and energy focuses on the things that yield what they're told they'll be rewarded for. And at the moment, that's primarily volume and prestige and very little about other values like equity and, and, and uh, equity in many dimensions, I should say. So if you want a healthcare system that values other things, you're not pursuing it through the messages we're sending through these, these salaries. So I would consider it an ethical and a value, and, and an ethical and a healthcare value problem. So, so let's actually dig into sort of what are the signals we are sending CEOs right now that these are the things that um, are valued and then sort of ask the question what ought to be valued. So um, we saw in executive compensation, hospital executive compensation, um, that the larger hospitals, major teaching hospitals, and those in urban areas tended to have higher compensation. And you can say that major teaching hospitals often goes with higher prestige. Um, but we also saw that hospitals of the same size and the same type in a single city uh, could pay their CEOs quite differently. So take the two, two of the large major teaching hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio, the Cleveland Clinic paid its CEO twice as much as Metro Health paid its CEO. So, and, and, and there was no difference, real difference in the pay for other workers. In fact, the Cleveland Clinic paid their average workers less than Metro Health did. Yeah, uh, we also found that high CEO pay doesn't really correlate with or or guarantee better performance on our social responsibility index. Uh, you know, maybe that's not a surprise given everything we've been saying. But here's one example. Uh, you know, Boston Medical Center and Albert Einstein, both large urban teaching hospitals, they pay their executives close to 2 million, but one of them does a whole lot better when it comes to social responsibility. That means racial inclusivity, community benefit, and avoiding overuse. So Alan uh, and Merrill, what could be behind, or what's driving this difference in each of these cases? These are comparable in many ways, but obviously very different for some reason. Well, I think, uh, let me address the first example you gave, which was out of Cleveland, but I think you could find this in an awful lot of cities. And that's where you have a high prestige hospital with a very good payer mix, which means you have an excess of privately insured patients compared to publicly insured patients. Whereas you look at Metro Health, where you're really dealing in Cleveland, for instance, where you're really dealing with, you know, much more of a large Medicaid population, a older population, so disproportionately on public programs. And uh, therefore, you know, this, it, again, if you're in a system that rewards volume, <laughs> you're going to see that at a place like, you know, the, the, and the reward structure at a place like a Cleveland Clinic is going to be very different for the CEO than it is going to be for the CEO of a Metro Health. In my own city of Chicago, you have the same exact thing. Look at Northwestern versus Cook County Hospital, which is a public hospital. So obviously its CEO salary is going to be significantly lower, but even, you know, some of the other large teaching institutions like Rush Presbyterian, there's going to be some huge differentials there uh, based on the prestige factor. And, and Alan, this is sort of a little bit of the rejoinder where you have, there's a lot of competition, you know, in big urban markets, there is competition, but even within big urban markets, I think you see a real, it's almost like, you know, the Harry Potter sorting hat, you know, these hospitals know where they are on the firmament. And they can, you know, I think that to a certain extent, their clientele is predetermined. Uh, and, and then you get to the, v, the you know, what Vika uh, said earlier, which is, is that, you know, that people, uh, it, it is not uh, guaranteed, you know, it is more guaranteed. <laughs> you don't go shopping for healthcare services. And if, you know, if you're in that channel, you're in a particular channel, that's where you go. So uh, I think competition in healthcare is uh, over overplayed, uh, actually. Well, Alan, would I can I ask you one thing about this? Because would it be 
fair to say that the driver of this is really segregation in the insurance market, which is from segregation in the labor market. If we had one price, one payer, or some version of that, wouldn't some of the drivers start to fade? Uh, well, there's a lot in that question. I mean, I, I, I agree with Merrill that there's a payer, that there's clearly a payer mix uh, difference in, in the Cleveland example. Um, I, I'm going to channel some of the economists who sit on a council we have on healthcare costs and quality and say that although if you take all of the hospitals in the country and do a regression of price versus quality, you don't find a positive uh, correlation. The, the, yep. the fact that that doesn't exist writ large doesn't mean that there is no connection between price and quality. Quality measured, described, experienced differently by different people. But the, the premium value of the clean Cleveland Clinic is not just a payer mix. It is a reputational value. And that is real in an economy. That's a real value. Uh, we, we can argue about how well specified it is, but I think it'd be a mistake to think that there isn't a quality or reputational quality component here. Um, so uh, I'm also, I think payer mix has a much bigger effect on profitability or margin than necessarily, uh, you know, just around CEO pay. I'm sure you could run those numbers, I haven't. Um, and, and I don't, you know, Meryl, I don't think we're really on, different sides of this. Maybe we're sort of leaning a little bit in one direction or the other, though. Maybe we are on, uh, on different sides of this. In my experience, there is quite a uh, fight over market share. But again, it's not so much at the individual patient, how do I find them level, as it is uh, getting the right feeder paths, whether it's through physician groups or physician ownership or through, you know, an, an emergency room, which has now become a profitable line when it used to be a, a loss leader. I mean, I, I think those competitive, I mean, frankly, that's a lot of why when you look from a distance, nonprofits don't look all that different from for-profits in a lot of respects, because they're all looking for market share. And that's what the boards are telling their CEOs that they want. Um, and so I, I, I think it's possible both that market share is relatively stable around certain cores and that there's heavy fighting for the portion that's movable and both of those come together. Uh, and, and, and so you have a combination of stability and some real competitive forces. Now, just a last thought on single payer. I mean, it depends which model of single payer you're talking about. If it's the, you know, if it's the UK model, then the salary is set. That's kind of easy. Um, but of course, there are lots of countries that have what we would loosely put in a single payer or at least a, a, a variant of a single payer model where there's still competition across hospitals. And so that wouldn't necessarily uh, eliminate the difference. What you really have to do, as, as you addressed, uh, mentioned, is, is look at payer mix, but that's a different topic. So, so let's be clear about one piece of this, though, is the, the reputational piece. Um, it, it was one of the motivations for us to create the Lown Hospital's um, Social Responsibility Index. And reputation matters definitely to CEOs and to boards. Um, and I can quote a CEO um, who said to all of the department heads, I want to go up two ranks in our competitors ranking, our competitors, um, US News and World Reports, um, uh, best hospitals uh, uh, list. And the problem with reputation is that it does not correlate with many of the things that we all sort of assume hospitals are supposed to be doing, like taking care of their community, like taking care of everybody, regardless of color, education, et cetera, like um, providing the care you need and not giving you care you don't need. I mean, all of those things 
are have not been part of reputation. It's been something else, which is part of why major teaching hospitals generally pay their CEOs much more because they have this reputation, they have this revenue stream, they can command the private pay patients, et cetera, et cetera. So it's this sort of self-reinforcing process of reputation building um, that is very, very much in the minds of CEOs because it's very much in the minds of boards. So um, this is kind of leading us to our next set of questions about what should be the metrics by which hospitals are measured um, and, and how can they be shifted. Um, yeah. But do we want to do a couple of audience questions, Vikas, at this point? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, we are fast running out of time, but um, uh, there's a couple of questions. You know, you'd expect health, you would expect health outcomes if they improved, readmissions dropped, efficiency improved. That would be something that justifies salaries. But I think we're going to get to that in the next section, like what could be some metrics. Uh, there's a question about, is there a correlation between community benefit and executive pay? And the short answer is not really. There are some weak correlations. And, and let me just say for the record, um, because I, you know, I want to be clear, the clinic is a great institution. They have super high quality care, and that's true around the country for academic, I mean, Cleveland Clinic, sorry. Uh, for, uh, and we've seen that in our own work, our own risk-adjusted mortality numbers our overuse numbers, many of those are actually, uh, you know, academic centers do, and, and the name brands, if you will, do very well. It's really the fact that that kind of falls apart when you start thinking about equity, when you start thinking about what does everybody get in this society? So I think it's a fundamental issue, but let's move on. Um, Alan, I saw in the latest issue of Health Affairs, some research that shows that black women are more likely to have the lower paying jobs in healthcare. Um, so what's the relationship between racial equity and pay equity here? I mean, you wanted to talk about, you know, bringing the denominator up. Oh, what are your thoughts? Well, I'll run out the clock if I share all of them. I mean, there's a racial equity and a, and a gender equity here, too, uh, very much in play. There's racism and sexism in play. Let's be honest about this. Uh, the boards historically have been composed of people who just look who look exactly like the CEOs and they're the people they play golf with. And that's and they want them to be paid the same levels they're paid. And and that's who they're you know, that's the peer group that they're comparing against and the the. Uh, so I, I sort of don't even know where to go. It's it's baked in, and I just always keep coming back to you know it is sort of the definition of a systemic problem. It's just like systemic racism. If you keep doing what you were doing, even if you're no longer acting in an actively racist way, you're sustaining systems that were built up and created those inequities. So we have a whole history that's led us to the point where we are right now. And if we just sort of leave it in place, it will work on autopilot and nothing will change. And um, so it's time to change it. So let me take a, one look at one aspect of this, which, which is on pay equity. You know, the question always in my mind is, is to what extent is the money going in excessive salaries, not just for the CEO, but for the entire C-suite? And then when you look at the top rank, the physician managers within hospital, many of whom earn seven-figure salaries, department heads, because they put heads in the beds, as the hospital executives like to say. And, you know, that's, and that's what drives both their top line and their net income. And is there enough money there to actually redraw the budgets of hospitals in such a way that you actually can bring up the denominator? This doesn't get exactly to the issue of racial equity uh, or gender equity directly, but if we know that uh, people at the bottom distribution, you know, the, the orderlies, the uh, technicians, the nurse assistants, it, all the people that, you know, that 50% of your workforce that makes the hospital run, 
you know, if we were to bring all of them up, you know, by two, three, four dollars an hour, how much does that actually cost within the context percentage wise of a hospital budget? And how much of that could be realized by simply reducing the inequity within the salary structure? Uh, now, you know, we have it, it once existed in a different way. Just a very quick note, and I'm not going to mention any names, but he's well known in health policy circles. And somebody wrote to me this week after I wrote my, my article on this subject, and he said, you know, my father had been the head of a hospital back in the 1960s, and we were poor. <laughs> you know, we didn't make a lot of money. And, and today, of course, that would not be the case. And, and so I, I think that uh, this is an internal dynamic that I think obviously boards could address, but it presents a structural problem that Alan discussed very well. They're like the people who are the CEOs, and that's a problem. If you had greater community representation, maybe you could begin addressing this as an issue. But I do think the internal uh, salary structure of healthcare needs to be looked at from the CEO and the top level and also at the bottom level. So you, you embedded a question in there, which was, is there enough money sloshing around in the system in any given hospital that you could actually pay people at the bottom something closer to a living wage? And I don't know the answer whether we've made that analysis or not. And believe me, if you try to find literature on that subject, you're not going to find it. It is not something that has really been looked at in any kind of systematic way. But I do believe that, you know, if you actually look at the top 20% of paid workers within hospitals, take a look at, you know, how much their salaries has gone up over the last 30 years, not just vis-a-vis -vis the lowest paid workers in hospitals, but comparably situated workers in the private sector. And you may find that, in fact, that there is a kind of a rebalancing that could take place if you had a hospital management that wanted to do that. And that, of course, if you rebalance it that way, you're not talking about pouring more money into healthcare. You're talking about using the money that's already in healthcare in a more efficient manner. And, and ultimately, I think would create a more productive workforce and a positive kind of uh, reinforcement loop that would drive better outcomes and as well as a more happier workforce, a more stable workforce, et cetera, et cetera. So we created a list of, of sort of the criteria that we thought were important for deciding on, on CEO salaries. But um, I'd love it if both of you would kind of give us three each. Um, what are the criteria? What are the, the, um, the outcomes or the, the, um, the, the outcomes that you would say these are really important for aligning what com communities need to what the C-suite is paid in a hospital. Well, let me let me just you know I if you look at CEO salary structure and, and any any salary structure top management at, at any kind of company today you're going to have your base salary and you're going to have your bonus. So if we're trying to change the incentives. It seems to me that what we need to do is take a, a look at what is being incentivized and say, is that, you know, the right thing to be incentivizing? And then say, you know, are there other things that we can incentivize? And also how much should be dependent on certain incentives? So, you know, if you have right now any about 20 on average, obviously, but according to consultants, I speak with about 25 percent of a of a CEO salary and other C-suite salaries will be focused on what you might call financial indicators. In other words, you know, what is your <laughs> net income? You know, what is, you know, are you being dinged by Medicare on, you know, the various things that they can ding you for, hospital readmissions or, or quality factors? Are, are, are we getting dinged on that or are we making money on that uh, off, off Medicare? You know, so that's a financial factor ultimately, although it does play off of quality. And then you have all these other factors that are increasingly because they need to show something. Are we environmentally sustainable? Are we improving community health? Are we... 
you know, improving on certain quality indicators that aren't financially penalized? Uh, are we dealing with, you know, uh, diversity and inclusion? Uh, you know, all of these enter in. But the problem with this is, is that if you only give like 1% of your or 2% of your total salary dependent on any one factor, then it's, you know, it's the kind of, and nobody ever gets an F grade, it's never a zero. So you always get 50 or 60% if you're doing poorly or you get 100% if you did well. So at the end, it, it kind of becomes not a very uh, influential thing. So what I would do, because I'm a great believer in population health, is, is that I would take that full 25% of salary, I would pick two or three uh, things. I would say, I would put number one, what have you done to show that you've improved the overall health of the community in which you reside? I would make that a really top financial uh, incentive for uh, hospital leaders. I would say uh, diversity and inclusion is a huge issue today. And I would say, quite literally, lower it, bringing up the bottom half of your workforce and creating workforce stability and creating a living wage for your workforce. So if I were to look at three issues that I think are vitally important, I would take those three and I would say, you know, if you want to have a net income, you know, it's a lesser factor. Okay, don't let it fall, you know, 2% margin, or you can't, don't let it fall, but don't reward them for getting a 5% or a 6% or 9% margin. You know, no margin, no mission is always the mantra that they like to say in the nonprofit sector, you know, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that when you're up around seven or 8% margin, uh, uh, you know, maybe what you're doing is, is actually working against the mission of your organization, not helping it by having higher mission. So I would definitely downplay that one and raise up some of those others and make a huge, a large portion of a CEO salary dependent on them. So Alan, um, if I were a hospital CEO, it would be thankless listening to all of us criticizing left and right. It's unbelievable. It's got to be a tough job. But let me just say, look, I get sick. I want to go to a hospital. I want to be taken care of and I want good quality care. That's what matters to me the most. So with everything that we've all said, should outcomes or some community wide population health metric of outcomes be in the mix for what's an incentive? Yeah, I mean, I, Mer Merrill uh, gave a much more comprehensive answer than I can. I'm going to take this much more from a public policy side. And, and I, I think we should take a page from the effort to get hospitals to pay more attention to medical errors and quality more generally, which if you go back two decades, it was not a discussion. There wasn't a chief quality officer. You didn't have a quality committee on the board. We didn't have good quality metrics. You could say we still don't have perfect ones, that's for sure, but we've come a long way. Um, and I think we need to think of this similarly. And, and we need to think of it from two different directions. One is the payer direction and one is the board direction. So payers need things like scorecards and, and, and uh, uh, you know, rankings and minimums and rules to say, you know, we're just not going to compensate for CEO pay above this rate, or we're going to say if you're a contractor with medic, if you take Medicare payment, you have to pay your lowest paid workers a, a certain living wage. I mean, those are pretty easy things. They're hard politically, but they're really easy to do. Um, and we ought to just do some of those and get some wins and make some progress here. I mean, that, you know, we're, we're so skittish about this stuff. Um, that's a payer's job to say, I'm not paying for this. I'm not paying for never events, and I'm not paying for hospitals that don't pay a living wage. So those, those, we could do, we, we ought to be able to do both of those, not just one or the other. Um, but boards are really different. I mean, a, the board is governance. And because if you think about payment policy, think about the penalty for excessive readmission. Totally makes sense conceptually, but it's had very negative equity Im, uh, implications. And so when you use the club of payment writ large, you run a real risk of, of messing it up. So you need accountability, and that's what boards are and should be, more should than are in this area. But again, I think we need to take some lessons from the quality movement. It took years, it's still taking years, to educate boards, to care about 
the quality that you receive as a patient walking in the door, which of course, if you're on the board, you just assume is excellent or else you wouldn't be on the board. And to actually acknowledge that, that you know, if your CEO isn't paying attention to it and the board isn't getting reports on it, it probably isn't as good as it should be. And it may not be as good as next door and people are dying because of that. And I don't wanna be on the board of an institution where people are dying unnecessarily. We have to do the same kind of education. And that goes back, I think, Merrill, you, you've got to set community goals that reflect community values and community priorities. That's not a federal payer issue. That's not a tax exempt status issue. That's what a nonprofit should do. It should be responsive to its community. So I think, you know, you can pull those two together and, 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 uh, and plan on this being a long haul, but, uh, but use some combination of payer leverage and higher expectations for leadership for uh, board leadership. But it, it, so you, you've you've pointed up something really important, um, I think, which is my limited experience with hospital boards has been they are they were at least astonishingly unaware of what was actually going on inside the hospital. So at one point, I remember sitting with a number of board members from a very large system in California and saying, you know, these are the numbers, your hospitals are giving people, you know, this, this, and this over treatment. And they said, oh, no, that's not possible. And, and they're just not as aware as they really should be of what's really going on. So then I think about things like community benefit. Do they actually know what the hospital is donating to the community and whether it's paying attention to its obligation as a nonprofit? Do they actually know what the error rate is? And if they don't, um, how do we, how does that change? Because they're not reading health affairs, I think, sadly. Yeah, but you well, know, just, it's just one set, I mean, you know, federally qualified health centers have to have 50% of their board from the community. I mean, we yeah. can require things of boards if we want to. I mean, the 990 has changed dramatically. It's still a morass, but at least there are things that weren't there yeah. about compensation. 20 years ago. So, you know, yep. we can do these things. We just have to decide we're going to. So uh, got my eye on the clock. Uh, before we go to some more audience questions, uh, we just want to give you a peek at our next event. This will be on hospital racial inclusivity, and it'll be the first launch of our new year of data, including COVID data. So that'll be Thursday, March 17th, and we'll have Tony Eiten from the California Endowment. <laughs> and Brenda Battle from the University of Chicago. Uh, we're gonna discuss inclusivity, what COVID did, how hospitals can ensure that they're caring for all the patients in their community. You can register for that at loundinstitute.org forward slash presents. So a couple more questions. What is the incentive for a hospital board to care about this? Can CMS or other agencies require hospital boards to link CEO compensation to quality? or various metrics of quality. I think we heard a little bit of that, but maybe Meryl, you wanna add some more and go around? Well, I, that's interesting. I, you know, I don't know what the uh, legal requirements would be to have CMS add additional requirements to the payment structure. Uh, I, but I, you know, to get back to something that uh, Alan was just mentioning in this regard, I think it really requires educating boards. I think boards need to be the, uh, a major focus uh, here, and they're not being educated about what these issues are. I think that that's really accurate. And just, you know, I don't want to go into it in depth, but in my conversations with compensation consultants who work with boards, compensation committees, they tell me that there's actually been a decline in the amount of education that boards are getting, not an increase, which is what you might expect in the current era. And that was, I was a little bit shocked to hear that actually, you know, and, and uh, so I think that that needs to, you know, the idea of getting community representatives on boards and who specifically are interested on the internal workings of hospitals, including payment structures and living wages for the, for the rank and file of staff and the excessive wages being paid. I think that that is, uh, I think at an immediate pressure point uh, that could take place at the local level. And I think that's where the focus ought to be. Be. Can I can I just say I don't think you can start this process with boards. It's so disparate. You have to start it with something that the boards will pay attention to. So if there is a CMS policy 
that affects revenue, then boards will care. If there is a, an index that's splattered all over the newspaper about something that the hospital is doing that's negative for the community, hospitals will, it will care, hospital boards will care, but it's not going to start with enlightened boards. It, it will do, it, there will be a few of those, but you could, you, we're not going to get a proliferation through the sector, one hospital board at a time. What do y'all think about establishing a wage floor like the MIT living wage? Just, there's got to be a floor. It's a living wage, full stop. Pretty simple. I don't know how necessarily easy to implement. Politically, of course, always an issue. Well, getting back to what Alan, what you, if you were to do that through CMS, and you would now have revenue implications for the government, which now gets you into the world of CBO scoring. If you know by the time you want to put, because you're going to have to require, I think, some legislation to do that. Alan, I sort of agree with what you're saying that trying to do this one board at a time is is sort of like the Sisyphusian task, right, of pushing the boulder up the hill. Uh, but uh, you know, it it has its own uh, roadblocks to getting it done uh, uh, through CMS, and you know, I don't know that the political roadblocks are any smaller than the uh, social roadblocks of trying to do it one board at a time. Uh, let's just say that if we had some voices in Congress that were forcing people to pay attention to this. Uh, and then we were also pursuing it at the local uh, level and at the system-wide level, uh, where there are uh, many levers. You know, a lot of these are religious organizations, uh, you know, and when was the last time that these religious organizations paid attention to their actual mandates from dealing with poverty and dealing with living, living wage within their social action arms and trying to apply that to the hospital sectors that operate in those religions' names? So, and that's just one example. So uh, I would argue that uh, I think it takes all of the above if we're going to get some movement on this. Shannon? I agreed, all of the above. All, <laughs> all things have to be tried because it's not going to be a single, there's no magic bullet. There's no, no uh, healthcare fairy out there waving the magic wand that's going to fix it. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're ready to wrap up. I mean, there's a lot we haven't touched on. It's a lot of work still to do. Uh, even with our own data, we've barely scratched the surface. So maybe we'll be able to do some of that and, and share more with everybody. Uh, but there's no question that it, you know, this topic, <laughs> it, it, it's its own topic, but it's also uh, a lens on many, many other issues in society, as we've said, and in particular in, in healthcare. So uh, thank you all for joining us. And thank you to Alan and Merrill in particular to be guest panelists. Alan, editor-in-chief of Health Affairs. You can find him on Twitter. Uh, Merrill is the healthcare journalist educator. You can subscribe to his newsletter on Substack. Who's news? G-O-O-Z-N-E-W-S. And to see how your local hospital did on pay equity, go to loundhospitalsindex.org. Have a great afternoon, everyone. See you next time.